everybody. First of all, happy International Women's Day and happy International Women's Strike. And welcome to the 8th of March edition of our Thinking Through the Crises series of the Amsterdam Research Center for Gender and Sexuality, RGS. And the 8th of March edition is dedicated to the women's strike. My name is Sarah Bracke, and I hold the Chair of Sociology of Gender and Sexuality at the University of Amsterdam, and I direct the Amsterdam Research Center for Gender and Sexuality, together with Julie McBrien. Now, let me first say a few words about ArcGIS. The Research Center seeks to foster and consolidate a community of scholars and scholarship on gender and or sexuality within the Amsterdam Institute for Social Sciences Research. And this is a community shaped by many differences in disciplinary contexts and traditions, different theoretical and epistemological approaches, different methodologies, and also differences in the emphasis on gender or sexuality within one's research. And we are committed to make this um, an as expansive community as possible, where such differences are welcomed and are provide prof um, uh, fertile ground for conversation and new ways of thinking. So check our website to know more about what we do. Also check our vibrant community, uh, our PhD community, if you want to join for the PhD researchers and join the newsletter to stay connected. Now, in the midst of this global pandemic, like so many others, we've had to shift our programming online. And we began this academic year with a webinar series called Thinking Through the Crises, crises in the plural in which we explore current crises through a lens of gender or sexuality. And it was Professor Titi Bhattacharya who opened this series with a lecture on essential work, in which he stated that the pandemic has shown us in very clear terms what feminists have always known, and this is in relation to questions of work and questions of care, um, and proposed that, and she proposed that it is our job to analyze this landscape and joke it to deeper feminist understandings. And that is precisely what we want to do today. So today on International Women's Day, we come back to some of these insights and we continue to brainstorm about questions of care, work, and about the question, what is to be done? Now, International Women's Day is typically a day when we focus on topics such as violence against women and gender-based violence. Um, I would also briefly want to mention some of the numbers in the Netherlands because it's very often easy to think um, for people in the Netherlands that questions of violence are uh, not so, yeah, are, are, are not close by. In the Netherlands, annually, we have 200,000 cases of severe domestic violence. Every eight to nine days, a woman is killed in the Netherlands by um, a partner, ex-partner, boyfriend, ex-boyfriend. 90% of the perpetrators of violence against women and gender-based violence um, are men. Um, so violence against women and broader than only focusing on women, but gender-based violence, violence related to not doing gender properly, let's say, is a big focus, but also the question of the unequal division of labor between reproductive and productive work, and we will come back to that in a moment. Questions of reproductive rights and justice, and the question of sexual harassment, take back the streets, take back the night kind of marches. These are all typically actions and topics that we see um, focused on, that, that communities organize around on International Women's Day. It's a day of rage, it's a day of love, of solidarity, of action, and a day of feminist reflection. And that is what we want to do in this brief hour, feminist reflection. Now, in the last couple of years, we've seen mass demonstrations everywhere on this day, typically with hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of women and feminists and people of all gender on the streets in Spain, in Latin America, in Istanbul, in India, in Poland. We've seen women's marches uh, in Washington. We've also seen uh, the rise of, and the historian among us will probably say um, the coming, the return of, not only the rise of, the return of the women's strike. So today in our feminist reflection, we will focus on the women's strike and we do so in wonderful company. 
You will find an elaborate biography of our wonderful speakers on the website, but let me just briefly introduce Dr. Sihi Vertomme, who is at the Department of Conflict and Development Studies at the University of Ghent, conducting postdoctoral research on questions of political economy of global fertility chains. And uh, she joins us straight from the women's strike at Ghent University. Then there is Dr. Maud Bracke, who is at the History Department at the University of Glasgow. She's a historian of 20th century social, gender, and political history of Europe, and is currently working on a major book project charting the rise of notions of reproductive rights in post-1945 Europe, um, West and uh, East, in a global perspective. She is also my sister, and this is the first time that we actually are on an academic event together, right? <laughs> and then there is Dr. Ladan Rahbari, assistant professor at the Department of Sociology at our own UVA, who works on migration, digital media, gender politics, the body, with a general focus on Iran and Western Europe, and who is in the unique position of having participated a couple of years in the women's strike at Ghent University and is now at the UVA, which will help us, and that is also one of the aims of this meeting of today, to not only have this feminist reflection, but also bring it home to the UVA and think about what we could possibly organize at the UVA. So thank you so much for joining us, our three wonderful speakers, and we will start with uh, Dr. Sihi Vertomme, uh, who will talk about the women's strike in Ghent today. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for uh, Sara um, and also Diego and Robbie for organizing this, um, this amazing panel. It always, I have to say, makes me a bit emotional to hear uh, women and feminists talk about uh, women's strikes and feminist strikes. Uh, so I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, and as Sara already mentioned, I just came back from uh, an action we did at uh, Ghent University in Belgium. Maybe, I don't know if it will work, but I can quickly share some uh, some pictures you see this yeah um so this was our central uh, slogan of uh, this year's strike so it's the fifth year in a row that we're organizing a strike at Ghent university women's strike and this year because of the corona crisis we thought it was crucial to foreground that care and all the you know all the care buzzwords we heard over the past year that care is not just a bumper sticker but that it actually is uh, essential work and that it should be um, valued and appreciated um, and made visible as work and that that uh, paid and unpaid care work actually make not only make the world go around but also make the university uh, you know keeps the university going so we organized um, um, around this slogan uh, this year so these are just some pictures we put on a I don't even know how you say this in English a laundry line with all the dirty laundry in front of the rectorate which is uh, where the uh, vice rector um, is uh, has his office um, so voila you see the um, the, the green uh, panuelo as well represented just to make those connections very clear um, so voila these are just some uh, I'll just stop sharing now how do I stop sharing? Um, oosh, wait. Stop share here. Um, so as I said, it's, uh, it was the fifth year in a row that we uh, organized the women's strike at Ghent University. We started in 2017, and it was actually two PhD colleagues um, who took the initiative, uh, Luz de Basser and Doreen, uh, uh, and Doreen who uh, inspired by the, the, the global wave um, you know, of feminist strikes uh, that were uh, hitting us from South America, from Poland, from the US, um, and that kind of inspired us to also do something at the university. So the first strike we organized was um, for a gender equal and feminist university. And we had um, like four um, action points around representation, about work-life balances, uh, against gender-based violence, um, etc. And I think the main idea was not to, you know, not for a lean in feminism, uh, where we want just more, more women and people of color in uh, in top positions, um, but that we just that we that we wanted to change the institution into a more feminist institution that doesn't foreground output and profit, but that foregrounds uh, care and you know 
uh, life uh, rather than um, rather than this very productivist uh, approach. Uh, and we organized an event on the 8th of March in front of the Rectorat, the same place where we did an event this year. And the, you know, the men from our department, they provided soup and bread and sandwiches. And it was like a really uh, fun, uh, fun event. Um, and then it continued, you know, it, it, it continued. Uh, I left for the UK, but Ladan and other people, you know, kept, kept, uh, it, it kept on going. Um, so when I returned in 2020, I went to the UK for two years um, and I returned last year to Ghent University and um, kind of reflecting a bit how the women's strikes were evolving um, at Ghent University, we kind of realized that we mostly um, attracted lecturers, uh, researchers, um, you know, people who are in middle class uh, positions, let's say. Um, and that the people we didn't really reach with our strike were the people people lower in the food chain, right? So the cleaners, the cafeteria workers, uh, the restaurant workers, the childcare workers, and that that was a problem. If you you know if you aim to for feminism for the ninety nine percent, that it's kind of crucial to get those people on board. So we had a kind of a reflective phase, and we decided that uh, to first go talk to um, the cleaners, to the restaurant workers, to the cafeteria workers, less to the childcare workers, because it wasn't easy to reach them. Um, and rather than expecting that they come to us, we said we are going to go to them. So it took, it took us a lot of time and effort, I have to say. Um, we worked together with the unions, uh, with one of the unions, the Socialist Union. Um, and also without that collaboration, it would have been impossible to actually do that work. Um, so we went to, during the coffee breaks and the lunch breaks of the cleaners and the cafeteria workers, we went to talk. Uh, not to talk to already convince them what they should be doing, but just really to listen. So it was like really from a humble position. Uh, not because we know best, but that, you know, that they are the, you know, that they are the, the that they know best what, 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 what they need to improve their, their conditions, their working conditions. And then it turned out that the workers were outsourced to a subcontractor, that this led to shitty working conditions um, where people were, where cleaners were, you know, suffering from just, you know, physical work, uh, not being replaced when, uh, in, when they were sick, which, you know, created a lot of tension between workers, between the cleaners, that they don't have, that they have very low wages, that they don't have decent holiday rights, that they don't have decent, uh, you know, in, in case they are sick, that they don't have the same health, in, like health backups as we do, that they don't, that they have a very low pension, um, that the cafeteria workers are, um, I don't know how to say this in English, not, not statutaire, so they don't have a, a, a permanent contract to say, which comes with certain benefits. Um, so we realized that, um, the conditions of, of the care workers at, at Ghent University was not good. And that's why last year we really decided to focus on them and to not talk that much about the, the lecturers and the professors and this, but that we really wanted to focus on them. And we had three main demands to insource the cleaners again, to make the restaurant workers statutaire. I don't know how to translate that. And then to have a minimum wage of 14 euros for everyone working at the university, which is also not really the case yet. And that last year we had, and I'm going to use the word, 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 although it's horrible, we had a real strike in the sense that the unions um, backed us up with a real uh, strike, um, with the real strike. They applied for, they, you know, the people who went on strike got a, um, a refund, not a refund, uh, an, a fee, let's say, to... Uh, um, and it was a huge success. We had, uh, we had as well... Um, an event at the Rectorat. Uh, we invited all the cleaners, the restaurant workers to come for food, which was provided by the professors, which is mostly white male, eh, white men <laughs> working at the university. Uh, it was really beautiful. It was really successful. Um, and then came Corona, obviously. And then we had to really reshift and rethink how to, to organize again, because we haven't been able to speak, um, to speak to the cleaners, to speak to the restaurant workers. Everybody is completely divided now. And, I think that's maybe something good to pick up in the in the Q and A later. How to organize in times of uh, Corona? And this year, what we really aim to do, because of Corona and the realization that you know also lecturers and teachers and researchers are stuck home with kids, with double, triple uh, domestic work shifts, 
um, and a lot of unpaid <laughs> reproductive work that we are supposed to be able to do on top of our other work. Um, and that that just is, you know, normal that we should be doing that. So what we really try to do this year is to connect the condition of unpaid reproductive work with the condition, the conditions of the shitty conditions of paid reproductive work at our university, because we actually think that this is crucial in the women's strike. And what we try to do is to kind of make it clear that the reasons why uh, the working conditions of the cleaners, of the restaurant workers, of the childcare workers at university are so bad is because the unpaid, the, the, the unpaid condition of, of, you know, of domestic work and motherhood is not recognized as work at all. And for us, this dialectic is very important. And it's also very difficult to make those connections. But for us at the Women's Strike at Ghent University, this is kind of the aim. This is what we want to those connections that have been, you know, that capitalism has made so, um, has divided, you know, between production and reproduction, we want to make those clear again. So that's one of the, the aims. Um, another thing that has been really interesting, I think, at the Ghent University Women's Strike is that we had a really good collaboration between the feminist movement and the unions. And it's not easy, it's not evident. And it's hard work within the union to fight for those connections and it's hard work within the feminist collectives to make those connections, but it's worth doing it. Because without the unions, we wouldn't have been able to go to the coffee breaks of the cleaners because the subcontractor would have kicked us out. Really, they're very aggressive. <laughs> so we need those connections and it's not easy, but it's really worth to keep on trying. Um, another thing uh, that's that the strike after five years at Ghent University has taught us that we know that the 8th of March or the strike is not, is not an event. We know that it's a process um, and that we want to you know, keep that process of making those connections between badly paid reproductive work, work and non-recognized uh, domestic work. We want to make those connections clear, um, but still you have to organize an event on the 8th of March, right? So it's, it's, and it's a lot of work. So it's also in how to manage that balance between seeing it as a process and as a structure, the strike, but then still, still organizing an event, right? So we're still struggling how to, how to balance that. And then um, maybe the last thing that I want to say is that for, for us in the Women's Strike in Ghent, we want to, we want to be militant. Rage is important. It's not just Women's Day. Ah, oh, we're also happy, and here is a rose, and la la la. It has to be militant. We have to make, and I mean, for us in Ghent University, it's an anti-capitalist uh, and a feminist. Um, we have fe feminist and anti-capitalist demands to be. I mean, to, to put it very clear, but we also want to keep it joyful, right? And I think Sarah, we were together in a workshop with Silvia Federici, and this is something that really. Um, is really important as well. Like we, it, it cannot be that our activism becomes alienated labor, that we feel it as a burden and it's too much and how do we do? So this is also something like how to keep it militant and yet joyful, right? So um, yeah, that's some of the questions uh, that come from our, uh, from our um, organizing at uh, Ghent University. Thank you so much, Sigi. And yes, you remind me of that workshop and the chapter which was called joyful militantism, right, that we read together. So thank you. I mean, to me, this sounds very impressive what you've done in the last five years at Ghent University. Um, Maud, Dr. Bracke, uh, you have an even longer perspective than five years. So the women's strike, where does this come from? Thanks, Sarah, for, the, for organizing this, for having me here virtually in Amsterdam. So I would just like to highlight a couple of aspects of the longer term history of this. Um, and some of it really links in with, um, with some of the things that Sigi has already highlighted. So I'm just going to um, share my screen because I wanted to show a couple of uh, images. Okay. Can people see this? Yeah. Good. So um, there's actually a lot of disagreement and controversy among historians about where the idea of, of 
Women's Day or International Women's Day uh, the, or the 8th of March comes from. But one thing that is clear is that the idea to dedicate one day per year to women's rights and women's struggles originated with women in socialist movements, women of the left, women in socialist movements in the early 20th century in Europe and the United States. Clara Zetkin, leading figure of the German Social Democratic Party in 19. 10 put the idea to the International Socialist Women's Conference gathered in Copenhagen. And from the following year onwards, women in left organizations across Europe held women only demonstrations and in some cases also strikes on or around the 8th of March calling for political and economic rights. So the, the origins in the labor movement are clear. And what this means is that from the early years onwards, the focus was on demands relating to work demands relating to women's rights as workers, uh, dignity in the workplace, safety in the workplace, equality in access to work, the fight against layoffs, for example, due to pregnancy, um, demands for fair wages, later on also demands for equal wages, equal to men wages, and then also in a later stage demands for social security, including things like protected maternity leave. So that was that kind of work based demand was central from the outset. What was also central from the outset in the early 20th century was the focus on political rights, because the early 20th century, of course, was also the time of, of really powerful, significant feminist mobilization uh, on suffrage, on the qu question of women's suffrage and women's voting rights. And so that was also a central, uh, those demands were also linked in with the idea of the women's International Women's Day and Women's Strike in the early 20th century. One thing I wanted to highlight is that from these early years onwards, uh, immigrant, immigrant women were key in shaping what, uh, uh, what so in shaping the kinds of actions of, of these early years of, of uh, Women's Day. So for example, and especially in the US, this was clear. So for example, um, women workers at the Triangle Shirtwaist shirt -waist Company in New York in March, 1911, spontaneously walked out of the workplace following a fire in which 38 uh, uh, women uh, workers had uh, been killed. And so the majority of these women on strike uh, were Italian immigrants and their demands included safety, the lowering of work speed, work hours, but also demands for citizenship for immigrant uh, workers. And, that, the, and this was one of the events inspiring the adoption of Women's Day in the US. Immigrant workers played a key role also in another significant strike in the US between January and March 1912. Women textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts, supported by the International Workers of the World, so the union, the International Workers of the World, withdrew their labor, demanding higher wages, dignified work conditions, and suffrage rights. And their slogan, we want bread and roses too, was taken from a speech by suffrage uh, activist Helen Todd and inspired by a poem by James Oppenheim. And in some parts of the world, this slogan, but also the song Bread and Roses has become the unofficial anthem of International Women's Day. And I guess many people here will probably be familiar with the song. But it was in Russia in 1917 that one particular women's strike and one particular women's rally was uh, really consequential. Um, in late February 1917, thousands of women rallied in St. Petersburg on occasion of Women's Day, calling for higher wages, better living conditions and peace. And so the key slogan at that point was bread and peace. The ongoing war with Germany had plunged masses of ordinary people into abject poverty and women were key in attempting to manage family economies. So the march, this march, this rally sparked the February revolution, um, leading to a kind of largely spontaneous uprising across various uh, major cities in Russia, leading also to regime change, the abdication of the Tsar, but also to the granting of women's suffrage. And then throughout the interwar period, as we see, as in Europe, kind of the conflict between political forces of the left and political forces of the right exacerbated, what we see is that, that, that in that context, that that link between International Women's Day and uh, labor rights is really consolidated. And the link also between International Women's Day and uh, political rights is also really consolidated. And for example, that was very clear in Spain. In, uh, on March the 8th, 1936, really just months before the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, um, a mass women's rally, women's demonstrations were held 
uh, in the major uh, cities in Spain, organized by the Communist Party, but reaching many, women's, uh, many women outside the Communist Party as well. Uh, so mass rally to mobilize against the rise of the right led by General uh, Franco, to call for women's rights, which were under pressure by the rise of a fascist program, wishing to undo the political gains that had been made since the start of the 20th century and, to, and, and wishing to recenter women's lives exclusively, exclusively on the home and on motherhood. So then fast forward sort of after the Second World War, it's really in countries of the Global South that International Women's Day becomes really an important uh, uh, day. And what was really significant in that sense was that in 1975, the United Nations officialized the 8th of March as International Women's Day. So that this was a hugely significant event, I think, and it was especially, again, in countries in the Global South that following the UN marking that day, following that, uh, that those many of those countries adopted March the 8th uh, as a public holiday. Um, but what this also meant, of course, was that International Women's Day was institutionalized as a result of this kind of UN intervention. So from this point onwards, I think we see this really clearly. International Women's Day, the 8th of March, gets to be inscribed into various kind of gender equality programs at national levels and at international levels by various institutions. And I think what's clear also in recent, this, in, in perhaps especially sort of in recent years, is that what we could perhaps call the mainstreaming of the 8th of March and the mainstreaming of the idea of International Women's Day has also led, I think, to, or, or has also been accompanied, I think, by a process of commercialization. Uh, and I think, especially this year, I find it quite, stri quite striking, well, or in recent years, that there's, al there's always a t-shirt that one has to buy or a mug or, or a, a tote bag or something like that. So I think that is perhaps an, an aspect we need to talk about as well. But I think more remarkably and more significantly, however, I think is the other recent development, which of course Sigi has already been talking about in recent years that we really see a rediscovery and also a reinvention of International Women's Day in a radical sense. And so for example, uh, what, what has been very significant has been in Latin America and specifically starting in Argentina in 1917, the Ni Una Menos movement, not one less, um, which since, I, this is a very broad movement with many different aspects, but very generally speaking, since 1917 has marked the 8th of March as a day to express anger and demand action on gendered violence, including the mess, various forms of domestic abuse, and also really including any form of violence against bodies that are gendered as female in the public sphere. At the same time, then also there is, of course, the global women's strike, which we are talking about uh, today. And as Sigi already mentioned, which really Draw, does a number of things, including drawing attention to the gendered forms of unwaged work and care work and underpinned by the notion of social uh, reproduction. And just to conclude on this point, I mean, I think it's really interesting that in some ways, some of what Sigi has been describing in Hent and elsewhere really goes back to that older history of being connected to the labor movement, but of course with a, with a very important aspect here, a very significant aspect here of really reinventing, fundamentally rethinking and reinventing the very notion of labor and including various forms of unwaged informal care work into that uh, notion. So I think I'm gonna end it here. Um, so I have a couple of images here on the, on the slide which you will uh, see meanwhile, kind of identifying a number of key moments. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Maud, for giving that, that perspective, that historical perspective. Um, Ladan, Dr. Rahbari, how do we bring all of this back to the, or back to the, how do we bring this to the UVA is something that uh, we're not only going to leave on your shoulders, right? Where we will make this a more collective brainstorm, but you're gonna kick off that brainstorm. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Sarah, Diego, Robbie, and also um, Maud and Siggy uh, for your insights, um, uh, for sharing the panel with me. So yes, I've been asked to draw on my experience co-organizing a women's strike in Kent University in the past three years, um, and also to try and imagine a women's strike at the University of Amsterdam uh, with the rest of the panelists. Now, uh, this is not an easy task, of course, especially considering the differences between the two countries. Belgium and the Netherlands um, in terms of unions, organizational differences between the universities, and also what I consider to be different academic work cultures. Um, I'm definitely not the best person to talk about unions. It's really outside of my comfort zone. 
But even with my limited knowledge, I see differences between union memberships and mobilizations between the two countries. In the Netherlands, 18% um, of employees, so less than one fifth are in unions, while in Belgium, the number is half, so 50% of employees. Uh, the number of strikes in Belgium are substantially higher than the Netherlands. Um, and as for women's strike at universities, as far as I know, there has never been a women, uh, women's strike at the University of Amsterdam. While at Kent University, the yearly strike tradition goes back uh, now to five years, and same goes for other Flemish universities. There are strikes and walkouts, for instance, in uh, VUB that I know of. So let me throw in a little personal story first. Uh, when I arrived in Amsterdam in September 2020 to join the Department of Sociology, I was going around asking about about unions um, to inform myself on membership. And I remember most people in and outside of the university were not very well informed about them. And one person specifically told me, you know, Ladan, you don't have to be a part of a union. And I consider that quite telling um, in different ways, but also in the way that um, it shows how the question of having to or needing to unionize and collectively mobilize is understood differently. So what I will do here is shortly discuss why at UVA, we need to strike. And then I will try to imagine a strike uh, with the rest of you. So from the very beginning of COVID pandemic, we have heard about the crisis of care, of course. Uh, while this is certainly beyond the university, as Sigi mentioned um, some aspects of it, I will only focus um, on the effects on academia. I have to add that I will not do this exhaustively. Now, we've heard a million times that we are living in unprecedented times. And yes, this is not an ordinary period, but we can tell a lot about a system from its moments of crisis. Although this is not an ordinary period, there are many things that are not entirely out of the ordinary about this period, such as patterns of precarity, the patterns of aggravation of work conditions uh, under COVID that are telling in that they follow the already existing distributions of precarity. In academia, for instance, if I uh, have to give you examples, burnouts and overwork are unfortunately somewhat ordinary experiences, um, so much so that they are sometimes worn as badges of honor. COVID-19 has impacted our workloads, teaching research has have gone online, um, academics are struggling with access to spaces, equipment and networks of support, combining research and teaching has never been um, so difficult. Now add to this the total or partial school closures, people um, around us falling ill, uncertainty and sometimes vague, slow, inefficient governmental and institutional decision makings. And as a result of this, we saw very early on that women's uh, journal submissions, for instance, um, decreased. There is already global research from Australia, the Middle East, India, Canada, United States. We see that women suffer most financially by opting for lower work hours um, because of their care responsibilities that they do take on themselves. Same, and, and it is put on their shoulders. Same research also shows that women of color have suffered most from unemployment caused by COVID. Again, this is a continuation of realities already existing before COVID. Take the Netherlands, for instance, where a gender pay gap um, is persistent. Now, this pay gap is not only a gender pay gap. Uh, the gap has to do with women paying the penalty of working more part-time hours. Again, we know this from before COVID, that only about a quarter of women in the Netherlands work full-time. At least some of those people who decide to opt for part-time work uh, do this because of their uh, care work. And some of those women work part-time um, because they cannot work full-time. So they would work full-time if they wanted to. Now you hear me uh, talk about part-time and full-time work. And you, some of you already noticed that my language is extremely flawed because many of these women don't work part-time. They do get paid for part of the work that they do. And as feminist economist Nancy uh, Fulbert explains that the language of work that we use, the language that is popularized by economists is problematic in nature. The gender pay gap also has to do with differential occupational levels, uh, with men occupying most of the, the higher positions in both Netherlands and Belgium. Universities have a substantially lower share of women professors in all levels, but when it comes to full professors, for instance, the number is 24% um, for all universities in the Netherlands in 2020. The figure at UVA is close to that as well. Um, the pay gap also has to do with the racial and uh, ethnic backgrounds. The dominant majority of care workers are women, women of color, with lower wages and, incident, and higher incidence of uh, part-time work. In academia, women um, are already burdened and expected to do more mentoring activities, support and care activities. Women with marginalized backgrounds not only have to take a larger load of that care work, but they also have to carry a heavier weight under different forms of pressure 
some of which they share with other academics, but some they don't from discrimination every day and structural experiences of racism, racial sexism and aggression, um, which brings me to the other reason why we need a women's strike at our university, because racism and aggression continue to exist in our institution. And we need to provide socially safe environments for our students and staff, for survivors and people victimized by all forms of abuse, um, to ensure recognition and to hold perpetrators to account as well. Just like women's strike at uh, Hient University has never been solely about sexism, but also uh, racism, transphobia, um, ableism, and fighting all forms of discrimination, I think we should envision a strike at UVA where all of these forms of abuse of power are um, on the strike agenda. So yes, I think we need a strike. We need to strike because discrimination still happens at our university. We need to strike because our university has not adopted intersectional thinking and it still has the illusion of meritocracy while talking about inclusion and racism continue being risky conversations. And our students' loud calls for decolonization are not heard enough. We may not have to strike. We may not have to join a union. Um, it may not be a personal responsibility, as feminist scholar Titi Bhattacharya and our colleague Margarita van den Berg said on this very platform, academic work like other work is a labor of love and abandoning teaching and striking might make us feel like we are betraying those we love most, our students, our colleagues, our beloved have written papers, but if we are to make our university better, then we may have to make it our responsibility we being those of us who can afford to do it, uh, including those of us in more secure positions, permanent contracts, and also with the help of our students who seem to be always a few steps ahead of us, and unions, definitely unions. So together we can weaponize the power of collective refusal, I hope. And I want to close with a shortened version of feminist theorist Tina Camp's definition of refusal. Refusal is a rejection of the status quo as livable and the creation of possibility in the face of negation using negation as a generative and creative source of disorderly power to embrace the possibility of living otherwise. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ladam. You, you wrote the manifesto. We now <laughs> just need to organize the strike. <laughs> thank you, Ladam. Thank you, Maud. Thank you, Sigi. Thank you for all of this. Um, we have um, kind of 20 minutes left to engage with each other, but also to, well, to engage among the panelists, but also really to engage with um, the participants. Um, I'm thinking now because maybe this is a moment to ask some concrete questions because there is a concrete question actually. So almost, you know, to get the information right and then continue really with the brainstorming of what is to be done. And the concrete question uh, comes from um, uh, the colleague Olga Sesneva, who asks, was the strike in Ghent organized with the social sciences faculty only, or was it across the entire universities? And were there fields or faculties where it was more difficult to organize? And if so, how did you work with them? So that's really, yeah, the question of, uh, yeah, the, the faculties and also differences between the faculties and how to cross those differences. Assuming it's it's for me, right? For Ghent University, so um, the, the the people who are the main organizers behind uh, the women's strike, most of us um, come from the uh, the social sciences, so that's um, that's clear. Um, but that doesn't mean that like you know every year we've gathered. I think between two and 300 people uh, on the 8th of March, all colleagues, students, uh, care workers at university and so forth. And those people come from, from you know, all, all different faculties at university. So I have no idea which faculties are more difficult to mobilize. Um, we always organized on a, you know, as a central, we didn't focus on one faculty, we organized at the, um, you know, uh, on, the, on the whole of the university. Um, and again, uh, and, I, and I say I feel uncomfortable speaking about this a real strike, but only last year in 2020, when we organized the strike for the cleaners and the cafeteria workers, there was, uh, you know, it was covered by the unions. In other, if other years, the unions also supported us, but not, or one union supported us, but not, um, not by really um, applying for, um, uh, you know, applying for, uh, how do you call it, uh, for, 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 uh, for, uh, you know, for a strike. 
So um, in that sense, it's also not based on, you know, per faculty, but it's as a, you know, we, we organize a strike university wise, so. Yeah, and I think I would like to continue with the question of the union, right? Because we've heard the union come up both in how the GEN strike uh, was such a success and how you actually organized, and also in Ladan's call for what we should do at the UVA, highlighting the difference in the Netherlands, the very low level of unionization. Um, and I also know that uh, MOD and also in a UK context where the union is very important for academics, right, where it's almost difficult to imagine, well, I don't know what the numbers are, but, but you know, in general, academics are part of uh, unions or well, I, I would like to focus on this importance of the union. So, Sigi, you told us a little bit on, you know, the how and the mechanics. Um, Maud, can you maybe also talk to what, what the union does in a UK context? And then we will continue with what we can learn from that for the UVA with Ladan. Yeah, um, I mean, so, so in, the, in, in the UK, the, the academics union is, is UCU. Uh, some people here will know this universities and colleges union and but it is a union strictly for academics um and so i mean I, and i had lots of questions for Sihi as well in in terms of the actual practical organizing with the union because if i'm thinking about the situation in uk so the problem would be of course that the cleaners and uh, the catering people and so on are in a different union so they would be in the in the uk i no i'm not sure which union they would be in a different union and maybe there would be, well, there would definitely be more than one union amongst them as well. So um, you would have to do that. Um, I know there, there have been discussions in UCU around organizing, I don't think this year, but there have been at some point discussions in UCU around organizing a women's strike on the 8th of March. But again, of course, and that would be limited to the academics, which is fine. I mean, which is great. But I mean, I really like what, you know, the idea of what Sihi has been explaining, what's been happening in Kent and elsewhere of really focusing on the care sector around the university, which sustains all of us. Um, and so in the, yeah, in the UK, one would, yeah, you would have to think, you know, you would have to then mobilize people within those other unions that, 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 that uh, people are members of. So, um, but I mean, the, just more generally on the question of unionization among academics in the UK, yes, I mean, for me, this is really important that in the UK, we do have, depending on the university campus and depending on the kind of university you're talking about, as you can imagine, probably, but at least in my university, Glasgow University, there are very high levels of unionization. And I've been in the UK 15 years, we've been We've had four major strikes, I think, and including one last year. And I think, I don't know, Sihi, if you were in the UK at that point, it was right before COVID was a major strike. And I, for me, this is very positive. And I mean, without the union, not, you know, not that our work conditions are that great, but without the union, they would certainly be, be worse than they are. And, and specifically on gender, UCU has not been bad, I think, on questions around maternity leave, for example. So, I mean, so that, that's positive. But, but, but again, I mean, to take it back to the question of care, I think one would have to organize this in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. And I, I want to come um, to some of the other questions um, that relate to this by our colleague Saskia Bonjour, who comments that as a PhD researcher in Maastricht, I experienced great support from the trade union, the FNV, uh, in fighting the erosion of labor rights of PhDs. Um, and also the FNV is the union who has allowed undocumented domestic workers to unionize in the Netherlands. And it's really great to see that also, you know, uh, Saskia's comment, reaching out to PhD students, right? Be in, in this culture where people are not unionized in the Netherlands. I can imagine that as a PhD researcher, you might think really that the union is not for you, right? Like on a contemporary, um, a temporary contract and so forth, that the union is not for you. So this is kind of emphasizing that for Saskia as a PhD student, this was very important. Um, I actually, maybe this is just also a good moment to announce that I will be on the FNV list this year. So people at the UVA can actually vote for well should vote <laughs> for to put people in the on the naming strat in the i'm also blanking on the english translation in one of the in the workers council in the workers council of the uva and um yeah so first of all do vote because i do think one thing that the union does which is what we also need for the union for the women's strike is to make academics remember that they're employees 
right? That they're actually employees with working conditions. And um, yeah, so people should vote. And if they want, they can vote for me this year. I'm just adding that in the mix. Um, if there, I don't know if Ladan, you want to follow up on the union, because then there's a question that takes us to something different. No, not really. I just, um, for me, the observation that a lot of people did not know about unions uh, in the Netherlands, people who have been working um, in, a, in, a, in a, the Dutch system, people who are Dutch. I mean, we also have uh, our colleague, Johan de Deken, of course, I think uh, he's also in the, in the participants. I wish he, he would have joined us because he would be able to tell us a lot about um, the unions in the Netherlands and um, he's in here. Belgium. But then he's here. He is in the seminar. Oh, wow. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because it would be nice to have that, you know, insight about um, what are the possibilities, because I think some of the issues that Maud raised, so for instance, academics being in a specific union, and then, you know, there, there is another union where you can join, but then you, there is a pool of, you know, different kind of em um, employees who are together. And I think an action like the action that we had in Kent uh, would only be possible if the union was, you know, for everybody, not only specifically for academics. And that's why the uh, Kent University action was, um, I think, a success. And I think it was a success, wasn't it, Siggy? Because I remember that um, I don't think that uh, permanent contracts were given to the care, uh, care workers at the university, but their contracts were um, very improved. So they had better contracts. So I remember that we sat, I don't know if you were there or not, but we actually were invited by the rector and vice rector of, of Ghent University. And me have, and I think three of us, uh, three colleagues, um, went to this meeting and we discussed uh, these issues and, and we brought them up. I have to add that the meeting was in Flemish and I felt pretty uncomfortable sitting there as the only non-Flemish speaking person. I couldn't voice anything, but a collective we uh, voiced our demands and uh, our voice was heard at the end of the day. So um, can, you, can you also elaborate on that? Was that a success for you? So, so last year, two of the three demands, we actually won. Eh? So the statutarization of the restaurant workers and the childcare workers, uh, we won in principle. The, um, the board of directors uh, agreed in principle that they will look into it. Uh, so that is, uh, and also the 14 euro minimum wage uh, per hour, we also won. The one that's spending is the insourcing, which is proving to be a very, uh, a very difficult issue, not only at Ghent University, but also at other Belgian universities. So our strategy now is to make this not only a, a battle or a struggle at Ghent University, but actually to enhance inter-university, to organize an inter-university brainstorm with other Belgian universities, because it's the same everywhere. All cleaners have been outsourced since the early 2000s or end of the 90s. Uh, to, to, you know, to shitty subcontractors. And this has to, you know, this has to change. Um, uh, and the, the discourse is always, um, you know, you know, we have to save money somewhere and it's either saving money on cleaning or saving money on education. And it's exactly that completely false binary that we, I think, as feminists have to, um, you know, we have to, we have to make it clear that this is a fraud and without, as Mod already said, without this essential work of the cleaners, of the restaurant workers, there is no education possible, right? So I think that this is a, and, and this is also something where the union can really learn from the feminist movement. And, and I want to insist on this. I was already, I joined, I was always, I've always been active in the union and, you know, it, we have to also be clear that it's a very masculinist, productivist environment. And when we did our meetings, and Ladan was, was also there uh, for last year's strike, and when we had to go to all the cleaners and the care workers, the restaurant workers, most of them are women and people of color. Uh, and when you have to start asking questions about, uh, you know, uh, reproductive questions about how, how, you know, how they're managing their work, how their situation is home, if they manage to combine everything, you know, many of my union co-workers, they, who are men, you know, it's, it's weird, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to ask those questions in a, in a convincing way. So they also needed us from the women's strike to, 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 to make that possible, right? So I think we, we really need each other and, and, and we can really um, make each other stronger. And I was very proud um, last year um, that that worked for the Ghent University Women's Strike and still until today that we have a good collaboration with one of the unions. The other union, uh, Christian Democrat Union, they basically boycotted us, but at least with one union, it worked really well. And, and, and also to bring more reproductive and feminist issues in the union about what, what, what is a workplace? 
where does the workplace end? Is, does it end when we go home, when we open the kitchen door, when we open the bedroom door? Is that still a workplace? Who is a worker? What is work? Like these are, for, for many people in the union, it's very clear, but it's not. And it's up to us feminists to make those, you know, to start deconstructing that again and to make that deconstruction a political issue. It's like really a political issue that, you know, doing the work home is also a workplace. It's also, you're also a worker. And that these issues are as crucial for a union to take into account than only when something happens at the real workplace, right? Um, and, and I think that's important. So that's why I always, I've, I've always been active in unions and I think I will keep on doing that. But I also want to keep on working in the feminist movement. My hope is that the two can just at some point merge, right? That we don't even need different, but that we, um, so yeah, that was, what I wanted to add about both needing each other. I briefly want to um, add some of the comments uh, or the, 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 in the Q&A uh, box that still relate to union, but then I want to come to another question that is not um, about the union. But our colleague Rachel Sprong is uh, mentioning that we have the AUB, which is the education union from primary school to university. So as an other union than the FNV, and then our colleague Johan de Deke is asking Ladan why you then joined the AUB, which is <laughs> only for academics, well, you know, the other union is for the entire work uh, force. So there's questions about unions that um, I think we should be talking more about, right? So let's take this also as an opportunity to keep on talking about those questions. I also briefly want to mention what our colleague Marguerite van Hees is writing. She doesn't have a question, but heartfelt compliments for all of you. Your talks were inspirational and made her feel, and I think this is important, especially in times of COVID-19 isolation, made her feel of a part of a bigger movement that can expose some of these neoliberal, meritocratic, individualistic logics um, and Oh, and Marguerite will be voting for me. Thank you, Marguerite. <laughs> um, and then I think, oh yeah, and Olga is making a point, which I think is also um, really worth making, is that the FNV, so also the larger uh, union, not only focused on education, could use some more English language communication. And I do think that speaks to what Sihi also pointed out in relation to questions of feminism. There's questions of, you know, uh, international background, migration, undocumented, you know, all of these questions like that the union could also really use some work, right? So there's work and uh, connections to be made on all sides. Um, but I want to move on because we're, we're really going to stop at six. So I want to move end with the question by our colleague Evelyn Heertz. Thank you so much for this wonderful panel. I really love Ladan's emphasis on the notion of refusal, especially as a philosophical notion to help us construct a different academic, but also worldly imaginary. So, but how do we come up concretely with small and daily practices and acts of refusal within a heavily neoliberalized system that barely leaves space for refusal on an individual level. And so I think that is a crucial question. And I actually want to round up this panel by giving each of you a final word, um, if you can, thinking with this notion of refusal, or if you want to, you know, if you have a critique on the notion of refusal, go ahead as well. But I would like a final engagement, whatever you still want to say, um, but also connecting to refusal. Um, may, I, may I go? I, I just, first of all, thank you, Evelyn, for your question. And I think um, you would be able to give a better answer than, uh, than me on this um, if you were in the panel. Um, but I was just thinking of, um, again, Tina Kamp's work and um, how she uh, kind of theorizes refusal, not only as this notion that refusal has to be something that is always organized within an official setting. And I think this also speaks to what you were saying, Sigi. Um, so we connect to unions to, to organize um, our feminist movements, but we, we shouldn't think that that's the only way that we do refusal. Um, individual acts of refusal or um, smaller scale acts of refusal are also valuable. And I think um, the, the fact that we have this kind of collective understanding of refusal maybe eases the way for those smaller uh, praxis of refusal that you mentioned, Evelyn, a little bit easier. Uh, but I think there is value in, in every form of refusal, right? Uh, so we can also think about Sarah Ahmad here. So the, the way that every small moment of refusal and act of not um, subscribing to the ways of living that we have been forced on and that dehumanize us or make us intelligible or illegible, like Tina Kamp says, um, 
um, are acts that are extremely important. I don't think I, ha I have a very uh, good answer or a, or a, or a pathway uh, to, to what you're suggesting, but I think uh, this is a very, very important question to, to think about um, together. So thanks for asking it. I, I want to, um, I think it's the, the notion of refusal is really interesting because I think uh, that's what the strike also makes clear that we need to stop doing or undo certain type of work and then, you know, maybe put work in organizing different things. That's, that's, that's also clear. Um, but I also just want to make a, a brief point about who is able to refuse at the university. So the people who organize, who have organized women's strikes are PhDs, postdocs, um, you know, with cleaners, with people in such precarious positions. And what we actually need is ZAP in, 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 in Belgium, we say the ZAP or the, the people in, in um, you know, who are tenured, who have, who have permanent jobs. We need those people to step up and do the refusal work. Because if I refuse to publish five articles per year, which, which might get me a permanent job, or if I refuse to, um, you know, to still teach, uh, to teach until the, 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 the cleaners are insourced again, if I do that, I basically uh, you know, I, I boycott myself because that means that nobody as, you know, I'm a little academic entrepreneur, right? Uh, uh, I just boycott myself. Um, so with, I'm also part of a slow science collective in, in Ghent University and we really work on how we can, you know, slow down the university, create better working conditions for us to do our, our work. Um, but it also there, we, we, need, we need people who are in safer working, you know, working conditions to do also that visible work of refusing. Because um, otherwise it will, you know, it, it's very difficult to keep this going um, and to, to keep on doing this work as, you know, I'm not precarious in the sense that I have a low wage, I have a good wage, but I have, uh, I have you know, as, as, as many of us know, um, after two years, my contract will end again and I will have to look again. And I don't think not everybody will like to hire somebody who organizes strikes. So um, it's not only what to do. And I actually posted a link in the, in the chat where there's some good examples of what you can do to refuse, um, but also who can refuse. And I think this is worth uh, taking into account. Yeah. I just wanted to quickly follow up on that. I mean, this is exactly what I was thinking around refusal as well, that it's, a, it's one, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to say I refuse. And it's something that we've discussed a lot with the last UCU strike last year, where indeed a lot of PhD students and postdocs on temporary contracts just didn't strike because financially they can't. And also in terms of their future career, they can. So, so in that sense, refusal works as it doesn't work individually, it has to work collectively and it has to work on the basis of a critical mass of people. So, um, so that was my, my immediate kind of thought. My other thought was that I'm reminded of some of the radical groups, not only feminists, but also other radical groups in Italy in the 1970s who used refusal in a number of ways, but also in relation to slowing down. So that it's also about not just refusal, which cannot, is maybe not always possible, but it can also just be about slowing down and rethinking how we use our time. Thank you so much. I'm looking at time, respecting everybody's time, knowing there's children running around in houses, uh, in the panelists' houses. Um, thank you so much. I would say this is the beginning of many conversations at the UVA. We salute you at Ghent. Uh, thank you, Maud, for giving us the really historical perspective. And Ladan and all the people in the chat who have engaged um, Rendezvous next year, 8th of March, at the Women's Strike at the University of Amsterdam. Thank you and have a happy International Women's Day. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. <laughs>